All right, thank you everyone for being here. My name is Dr. Kristen Budd. I work in the graduate school and I'll be moderating this session today. So welcome to the 12th annual graduate research forum. So we're very excited to hear about all our graduate students' spectacular work here at Miami. So what we're gonna do today is we will go in the order of the program. Each student will have up to eight minutes to present and then we reserve the last two minutes for questions and answers. So in the meantime, if we could all stay muted, that would help with feedback. And then once we get to the question and answer portion, if you'd be willing to unmic yourself, ask your question, and then remute yourself just for feedback purposes, that would be wonderful. So with that said, I'm also going to give you some hand symbols. So when you have two minutes left, you'll see me give you the peace sign. And then when you have one minute left, you'll see me hold up one finger. Um, and then we'll flop into the um, question and answer portion. So we're going to go in the order of the program. So we're going to start with From the Moon to Miami, New Geological Insight from the first lunar meteorite. So if you'd like to share your screen, Jared, and then introduce yourself and your program and then get started when you're ready. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Jared Brum. I'm a first year master's student in uh, the Department of Geology and Environmental Earth Science. And my title is From the Moon to Miami, New Geological Insights from Lunar Meteorite, Allen Hills 81005. Uh, and my advisor is Claire McLeod, Dr. Claire McLeod, sorry. All right, let's get started. First off, you might wanna think, uh, some people think, why should we study the moon at all? Uh, well, it's our nearest neighbor in space. Uh, basically what NASA does is exploration. Uh, we wanna be able to, enable human expansion, not just physical off the planet, but, you know, ex expand our minds and bring knowledge and opportunities back to Earth. Um, also, studying the moon's processes and past events can lead us to a better understanding of uh, inner solar system uh, formation and evolution. <clears throat> also, uh, you know, from the past and in the, in the present and in the future, we're gonna be able to create and have created implement and implement uh, new technologies um, just from getting ready to go and uh, returning. Um, and these new technologies will uh, you know, give us a chance to have a sustained presence beyond Earth's orbit. Uh, also, uh, it'll enable us to foster international collaborations um, that we already have and uh, possibly create new ones uh, as we continue to grow uh, our presence in space. Uh, if you look at the quote at the bottom of the slide, uh, basically what it's saying, just what NASA does and what we do as planetary scientists, uh, everything we do benefits uh, all of humanity. Uh, so uh, Apollo to Artemis, humanity's return. Uh, from 1969 to 1972, there were six crewed missions to the moon's surface. Uh, and if everything stays on track, we'll uh, put humans back on the lunar surface 52 years after our last trip there with Apollo 17 in 1972 with uh, the Artemis program. Uh, and the, the picture on the left there, uh, that's uh, Dr. Harrison Schmidt, uh, is kind of a personal hero of mine because he's the uh, only astronaut that was a trained geologist uh, to go to the moon. Uh, so the six missions, uh, uh, this is a, you know, this is an image of the six missions uh, in the approximate areas that they landed on the moon. Um, they, the astronauts in these missions collected more than uh, 800 pounds of geologic material from known locations, and that's important, known locations. Um, which is great because we, we have constraints on where they're from uh, and the locations can tell us a lot about the material uh, that is present there. Um, but these locations are all uh, relatively close to e each other on the surface. Uh, whereas lunar meteorites um, that we don't know the locations where they uh, came from can offer a potentially uh, broader uh, sampling of the moon's surface. Uh, so my research is based around uh, ALH 81005, Allen Hills, um, and it was the first meteorite that was recognized as lunar when it was found in the uh, 
uh, Antarctic mountain ranges um, in 1980, 1981 season. Uh, it was found to be similar to the mountainous regions on the moon and not in the uh, um, uh, the lower regions where you know lava might have flowed on the surface. It's uh, classified as a breccia and a breccia is a type of rock that contains fragments of other types of rocks. It's kind of general, but no, that's how we classify it as geologists. Um, its age, so it was based off of three different studies in the 1980s uh, with ranges of 4.5 to 3.9 billion years old. And the samples or the, uh, the images at the bottom, they're all the sections that I have. So this is a whole section, this is a section, even there's several pieces, and this, this is a section. Um, and you can see the, in the, the little bits inside, um, larger grains, these are the actual, this is what makes it a breccia. So there's larger pieces within each section that are different types of rock. And research goals. So what is the moon made of? Uh, basically, we're gonna be characterizing the rock fragments and their distribution to learn about the impact site on the moon when the uh, meteorite was initially ejected from the surface. Uh, we wanna evaluate the physical attributes or textures of some samples using uh, microscopy. And then we also are gonna investigate the elemental compositions of the rock fragments and the mineral grains contained within the, each section. So we do this by using one technique. Uh, so uh, it's called opti optical microscopy, which is basically your typical microscope. It allow allows light to pass through this, the very, very thin sections and uh, allows us to look at the, the physical attributes and various textures and different minerals and anything else that we can see um, under normal magnification and lighting conditions. Uh, another technique we use is uh, scanning electron microscopy. So uh, these machines allow us to image the samples at very high magnifications uh, and let us observe the structures, textures, or physical uh, attributes and minerals at a very, very small scale. Uh, one program we use in conjunction with the SEM an, uh, analyzes the x-rays produced from the sample, interacting with the SEM and gives us chemical data. And with that data, we can further see further textures, uh, physical at, uh, attributes and differences in chemistry, and even boundaries of different rock types. And finally, from Miami to the moon, um, the, this work, I'm currently doing and future work we are currently doing uh, will result in advancing our understanding of uh, the origins of Earth's uh, nearest neighbor. Uh, and it's kind of leading up into the, the Artemis program. Um, and if you're interested in the uh, following the Artemis updates, the uh, NASA does have a Twitter and a Facebook, uh, among other social media programs and uh, they also they have a, a very extensive uh, website explaining the Artemis program and with that I need to go because I have to pick up my kids from the bus so I'm sorry I can't stay for questions but feel free to email me any questions you might have and I will be glad to answer them thank you all right, thank you very much, Jared. And I forgot to mention earlier, you have the reaction button at the bottom, so you can do thumbs up and the clapping if you'd like to give some kudos to our presenters. We always appreciate that. So safe travels to the bus and thank you for your presentation. You. So we're gonna move on to our second presenter. Um, so spiny urchins make for a prickly meal in ancient seas. So Whitney, if you'd like to share your screen, if you have a PowerPoint presentation for us. Of course, one moment. Alrighty, we can see my screen all right? 
Okay, excellent. So I'm Whitney and I'm going to be talking about anti-predatory morphologies in echinoids, which are sand dollars and sea urchins. So from about 250 to 66 million years ago, we have what's known as the Mesozoic. And with that, the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. It's a time that's typically associated with this rapid increase in diversification of new marine fauna. There's also new ecological innovations taking place, as well as this rapid shift from our Paleozoic fauna to what makes up our modern oceans today. However, there's some previous studies that have begun to suggest that these features and trends are occurring asynchronously across many groups of organisms, and that the MMR is not this consistent homogeneous event that it was previously thought to be. So let's take a bit more of an in-depth look at some of those characteristics, features, and biotic interactions of the MMR. It's been thoroughly demonstrated using mollusks, our snails and clams, that there's a predator-prey arms race taking place. So for instance, we have a population of snails, we have our very smooth shelled ones, and some that have more excessive ornamentation. Now our predators can prey, for instance, this one can prey on our smooth shelled snails. However, perhaps it's limited and its chelae or claws cannot fit or cannot crush these reinforced shells. So these shells, these reinforcements or ornamentation would be considered anti-predatory. As this continues through time, we have what is known as escalation. This is a back and forth uh, process between predator and prey. Now this is just one of many trends and features that's been demonstrated using mollusks. And so we find ourselves needing to ask ourselves if we're calling this the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, is it really a revolution if it's only being demonstrated in one major group? So we're investigating potential escalatory trends using echinoids, commonly known as our sea urchins and sand dollars. They've got a great fossil record. They, prey, were, they are preyed upon by a lot of different predators and they live in a wide range of areas. We have our surface dwelling, uh, sea urchins are epifaunal. We also have infaunal uh, sand dollars. Now you may ask yourself, why would these urchins benefit or why would these echinoids benefit from becoming uh, flat like this? So it's a process of infaunalization, which is this development of physical traits and characteristics allowing for an uh, echinoid to live under the sediment. And it's been proposed that this is, at least in part, to avoid predators. So predation pressure should be driving echinoids to move under the sediment. Recent work has examined this association between diversity and predation intensity using echinoids and predatory cassid gastropods, or these snails here. Now, cassids are a specialized drilling predator of modern echinoids, and we know that in the early Jurassic, we have our first appearance of infaunal echinoids. However, these predatory snails um, diversified so long after infaunal echinoids did, so we know that these classic predators of echinoids didn't drive their infaunalization. So that brings us to our question. If infaunalization occurred to escape predators or offer a means of escape, we should be seeing this relationship between the diversity of predators and the emergence of infaunal echinoids. So we are simply expanding our range and looking at all predators. In addition, we are looking at the emergence of anti-predatory morphologies across the urchins and their relationship with the diversification of their predators. Since we're in a global pandemic, we're limited to online databases such as paleobiology database and digitalized museum collections. Now, as for those characteristics, it's not hard to imagine that long spines might um, increase the effective size of a sea urchin, perhaps just limiting it from the predator even fitting it into its mouth to prey on it in the first place. Spine density. Uh, dense spines would require a lot more energy and be very time consuming for a predator to break the spines away in order to reach the body of the urchin. Spine shape might make things a little bit awkward, difficult to handle. 
and spine ornamentation, in addition to just being more sharp, uh, ornamentation has been suggested to uh, promote the settlement of encrusting organisms like this coral here that may offer some forms of camouflage, unlike our hat wearing urchin here. So far, we've uh, compiled our originations of new shell crushing or durophagous predators. And we also have our emergence of originations of new infaunal echinoids. Now we see since the late Cretaceous, we have this consistent in sync uh, series of peaks where new originations of both predator and prey continue to take place since our peak MMR. In contrast, there appears to be little or no relationship here with our red uh, cassid gastropod um, origination. So there does appear to be some extent of a correlation between the originations of predators and our infaunal echinoids. As for our anti-predatory morphologies in sea urchins, we are starting to see very promising results. Now our total diversity of predators here in black and our percent of echinoid genera that have a particular anti-predatory morphology. In this case, I'm showing you spine ornamentation. And you can see that we have nearly 100% of our echinoid genera that we've examined so far have some form of anti-predatory spine ornamentation since the peak MMR took place. So far, we have demonstrated that there is a correlation between infaunal echinoids and their shell crushing predators. Now, we are also still in the process of associating these anti predatory morphologies with the diversification of their durophagous predators. Ultimately, with either of these still uh, continuing to hold true, we have shown that predation does play some macroevolutionary role in the evolution of non-molluscan groups, which is ideal. And now our upcoming work will consist of expanding our temporal range. You notice there is a very large gap in that previous figure that I just showed you from the Jurassic and Triassic. We're trying to fill in those gaps uh, from the Triassic through early Cretaceous and collect more data. Unfortunately, we are limited to our digital sources, but we've not yet exhausted those yet. And I want to give just a quick thank you to all of our undergraduate interns that have helped me so much with this data collection, as well as my advisor, Dr. Carrie Tyler, and our funding sources. All right, wonderful. So at this time, we'll open it up for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. So I'm curious, Whitney, so what got you interested in studying this specific thing? I also like the little meme where it went under the sand at the end. <laughs> I was so pleased to have found that because it yeah. demonstrates exactly what infaunalization is. It was ideal. Um, my undergraduate work worked on uh, predation and predatory traces, drill holes specifically, from these predatory sea snails on mollusks, so on other predatory sea snails and also on your clams. Um, so this seemed like a very natural step to further look at more biotic interactions. They're something very critical in shaping our modern ecosystems. So this seemed like a very natural uh, next step to continue to expand the um, collection of organisms and different uh, clades that I have worked with. Wonderful, thank you. Does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask Whitney? Got time for one more. I can keep talking about how wonderful sea urchins are. <laughs> Throw in a few more pretty pictures. 
All right, Whitney, well, keep up the great research and we're going to transition to the next presenter. So just keep in mind, if you have any additional questions, you can type them in the chat or you can email them to us or the presenters and we'd be happy to share those with them. So the next presentation is detecting abnormal behavior from unknown radio transmitters. So Jason, if you'd like to share your screen, if you have some slides, introduce yourself and also your graduate program, please. Yeah, so um, I'm Jason Rook. I'm a second year master's student in the um, electrical and computer engineering department. And yeah, I'm going to be given a hopefully brief overview on the thesis research I've been working on over the past year. Um, I might be a little ambitious on the content here, so I might have to skip a couple slides. Um, but I'll start out with the context of our problem, give an overview of what anomaly detection is, um, and then give a little bit of results, um, hopefully if I have time. So the context of our problem is we'll have an emitter or a, a transmitter that's emitting electromagnetic waves. And we'll have our, what's called a wideband receiver over here that's listening in and looking to find these waves coming out from a transmitter it's not necessarily aware of. So these pulses are generally, or the, the waves are generally grouped into distinct pulses that we can um, um, then classify into the parameters the pulses have. So basically th this amounts to a pulse width which is the duration it's observed for, the carrier frequency, which is sort of how fast it's jiggling back and forth, and then the modulation type, which is sort of the pattern that the emitter is using. Um, so being able to gather this pulse information is really valuable to our receiver because we can combine it with our knowledge of how that emitter should be behaving um, and use it to track sort of the mode that the emitter's in or, or what the emitter knows about its surroundings. So we're seeking to perform sort of a surveillance role um, with our wideband receiver here. The problem is the emitter may quickly reprogram its behavior to prevent us from being able to perform the surveillance. Um, so when this happens, we need to be able to detect it in the incoming pulse data. Um, so that's where we're hoping anomaly detection is a good field to apply. So not only detections in established field of statistics already, um, sort of in data mining and, and comp sci as well, we're really going to be focusing on two different techniques for answering the question of, is this data an anomaly? Um, so first, there's unsupervised, where we just take a data set that we know nothing about ahead of time um, and try to pick out which regions are, are unusual compared to the rest. Um, and then there's semi-supervised as well, which is where we have to train on what normal data is so we can distinguish whether or not um, incoming data matches it. There's a lot of existing applications for anomaly detection, particularly in the network intrusion um, and computer security fields, um, but in a less adversarial sense it can also be used to find like faults in mechanical parts um, or even possible medical issues in medical imaging. Um, to our knowledge it hasn't been applied to our, our transmitter application here, um, so we're hoping to to do some unique research in the area of sort of merging these two fields. Um, one of the types of anomalies we're trying to find are you known as point anomalies. Um, so this is when a certain parameter about the pulse we see is just outside the typical ranges. So like these two are, are numbers that we'll get in. If the numbers are far away from the other numbers, um, you know, we're outside the mean or outside a certain number of standard deviations. Um, and that's something to flag as an anomaly. This can be a bit more complicated because we can have different types of pulses all intermixed with each other. Um, so the most straightforward way that we found to address this is to take um, these two numerical parameters, plot them as axes, and do a clustering approach. So each pulse that comes in that we receive gets some point on this plot. We group the points that are close together um, as belonging to the same type of pulse. And then pulses that don't belong to those clusters are anomalies. So this is a pretty straightforward um, um, detection approach. What's more complicated is when we have contextual or collective anomalies. So in the contextual case, this is when a value isn't unusual in the whole data set, but it looks weird when you look at it in context. Um, so a classic example is a really cold day during the summer or a, a 75 degree day on November 6th. Um, 
Collective anomalies, on the other hand, are values which are not unusual in any context, but it's unusual to see them all in a row. And this is a pretty classic example of that from a heart monitor, where the voltage of the heart stays constant for a long time, and that's um, an alarm, something that should be flagged. Um, so what we're going to be performing our contextual and collective anomaly detection on is actually discrete cluster labels. So if we take these results from earlier, we can assign each major cluster a numeric label. And then instead of analyzing a sequence of pulses now, we're just analyzing a sequence of numbers, a sequence of numeric labels for, for what stands out. Um, a way to do this um, is, for one, hidden Markov models, um, which is a bit much to explain in, in a short amount of time here. But it basically has a sort of stochastic model under the surface that accounts for various possibilities, but some are more likely than others, and the unlikely ones can get flagged. So what we'll do is we'll train this model um, using a, a preset training algorithm on a very long normal sequence, and then we can evaluate a shorter sequence to see does it make sense for this to be normal, or would this be an anomaly we need to flag? Um, so, Basically, if we have a long sequence like this, um, these labels can be anything. We'll be doing it on cluster labels, but um, we could even consider letters in this case. We can take a short window on this, get a score for that, and then repeat this across the entire data set. So, well, to a human, this might just look like a bunch of letters just in a giant jumble. We can find um, where the scores are lower and use this to um, flag a region where the behavior has changed, um, which is the anomaly we're looking for. Um, so real quick, this is sort of the sample output that our simulations run. Um, we alternate behavior between normal and anomalous, and we look to have our probability scores drop noticeably at these boundaries, and then, of course, rise back up when it becomes normal again, so we can flag exactly which region of the data um, is anomalous and because we want to go back and of course look at that. Um, once we have these scores, um, there's obviously a lot of noise on them so we can analyze the distributions and try to determine a threshold for our classification. Um, so at the end of the algorithm we're looking at everything to the left of this threshold is something our algorithm flags anomalous, everything to the right is not. Um, and obviously we're trying to minimize the amount of false positives and false negatives that occur in our data. Um, not really a lot of time to talk about long short-term memories. This is a neural network approach that serves sort of the same purpose. Um, and our goal in this project is to sort of compare the two approaches for which um, is a better, it, it performs better for application. Um, considering both computational efficiency, um, robustness to error, and of course the actual scoring. Um, probably don't have a lot of time to talk about supervised detection here, um, but we are hoping to use different approaches to solve the same problem without prior training, um, which is important for our application. So to conclude, we're looking at wideband receiver data and hoping to use this to flag when some unknown radio transmitter um, has changed its behavior, um, so we need to relearn how it's functioning. Um, with that, I guess I'll ask for any questions. Wonderful. We've got about two minutes for questions. So if you'd like to unmute and ask Jason a question, that would be great. So I'm curious, Jason, so for the next phase of your project, how long do you think will it take to analyze that data and get results that you can then put into action? Um, so um, we're hoping for you know, the purpose of getting a thesis together and getting an ongoing project I can pass to, to future students. Um, you know, I should have a good code base ready to perform these simulations in, you know, by graduation in May. Um, but the simulations themselves run actually really fast. 
So um, it's easy to just change little parameters and get new sets of data out. Um, so really the long part is the research on the techniques and then um, the implementation. But once it's done, um, you can run a lot of data fairly quickly. So how do you decide what your parameters are? Like this is completely outside of my scope of knowledge. So I'm, I'm curious how you decide what those are. Um, yeah, so the perimeter deciding, especially like on the machine learning side, is actually way out of <laughs> what I'm familiar with as well. Um, so, you know, I've been working with my advisor. Um, a lot of it's trial and error to see, you know, if we try this certain parameter, we train the network for this amount of time, then all of a sudden it doesn't work as well, then we know you got to train for longer, you know, something's not right. So it's a lot of trial and error. All right, wonderful. We appreciate your work. So good luck with the rest of your project. We're gonna transition over into our next presenter. So is a self-compassionate approach to failure a good predictor of confidence in sport? All right. Thank you, Dr. Bud. Hello, everyone. My name is Ara Shassar. I am a master's student in the Department of Kinesiology and Health here at Miami. My advisor is Dr. Weinberg, and my thesis committee members are Dr. Veely and Dr. Ward. Today, I will be presenting my thesis, Is a Self-Compassionate Approach to Failure a Good Predictor of Sport Confidence? Athletes typically refer to self-efficacy with the more popular term of confidence and often attribute successful performance to being confident and unsuccessful performances to not having enough confidence or to losing confidence. Overall, self-efficacy research has shown that the strength of one's efficacy beliefs influences the degree of effort athletes will expend to reach their goals and their persistence in the face of challenges and obstacles. In the last decade, Research has also shown that self-compassion is an alternative and adaptive form of self-to-self -self relating when faced with difficulties and challenges. For my thesis, I wanted to examine how self-compassion, the ways in which one relates to themselves during failure, affects their confidence to persist during the challenging moments. So what is self-compassion? Well, by definition, self-compassion consists of three pillars each with opposing aspects. The first set is holding painful thoughts and feelings in mindful awareness rather than over identifying with them and ruminating on them. The second set represents being kind and understanding toward oneself in instances of pain or failure rather than being judgmental and harshly self-critical. The last set is about perceiving one's experiences as part of the larger human experience rather than seeing them as isolating. Research in sports psychology has shown that self-compassion is a promising way for athletes to manage self-criticism and cope with, with setbacks. Self-compassionate individuals have been shown to take more responsibility for mistakes, show personal initiative, and engage in self-improvement behaviors. Additionally, high self-compassion has been negatively related to shame, fear of failure, rumination, anxiety, and depression. For my thesis, I wanted to look at how athletes relate to themselves in response to failure based on their level of self-compassion and how that relates to the different ways they define success and failure. To that end, I looked at achievement goal theory, which proposes two styles that have different criteria when defining success and failure. The first is task orientation, which defines success based on a self-referenced criteria, such as self-improvement, learning, and mastery. The second is ego orientation, which defines success based on an other's referenced criteria, 
For example, success for these individuals means outperforming others or winning. The key distinction between task and ego is that ego compares self to others when defining success, whereas task compares themselves just to themselves. An important note to also make is that individuals possess varying combinations of low to high levels of task and ego orientation. For example, someone can be high on ego and low on task, or vice versa, they could be low on ego, high on task, or you can be high on both or low on both. Research has shown that task-oriented athletes tend to expend effort and persist in the face of failure, while highly ego-oriented individuals typically give up and withdraw. Although there's consensus here that task-oriented individuals are more efficacious than ego-oriented individuals, it is unknown what mechanism leads to differences in self-efficacy among the orientation styles. Therefore, the purpose of my study was to examine whether self-compassion mediates the relationship between goal orientation and self-efficacy. As I mentioned, athletes have both task and ego. However, because I wanted to better understand how each relates to self-compassion, we looked at task and ego independently. So looking at the model right here, starting at the top left with the task, it was hypothesized that higher levels of task orientation will lead to higher self-compassion, which in turn would lead to higher self-efficacy. Now looking at, the, looking at ego on the bottom left, it was hypothesized that higher ego would be associated with lower self-compassion levels. We had seen collegiate athletes from a variety of sport in Division I universities across the West, Midwest, South, and Northeast regions completed the athletic version of the self-compassion scale, task and ego orientation and sport questionnaire, and the trait sport confidence inventory. After receiving IRB consent from university directors online, I emailed athletes introducing myself and the study, along with a link to the Qualtrics survey. Participating athletes first completed a demographic section, followed by the various scales in a counterbalanced fashion. For data analysis, I used structure equation modeling to conduct mediation analyses. Results indicated that there was no direct effect between ego orientation and self-efficacy. However, the results did show that ego orientation and self-efficacy were related through self-compassion. For instance, the higher an athlete's ego orientation was, the lower their self-compassion was, which in turn corresponded to lower levels of self-efficacy. Moving on to task orientation, mediation analysis revealed both a direct effect between task and self-efficacy and an indirect one through self-compassion. The direct effect suggests that individuals with higher levels of task orientation were related to higher levels of self-efficacy. Additionally, the indirect effect found between task orientation and self-efficacy suggests that individuals high on task orientation tended to also be high on self-compassion, which in turn corresponded to higher levels of self-efficacy. Overall, the findings from this study underscore the importance of self-compassion on the confidence of athletes. The primary implication for practice is that while increasing self-compassion in all athletes is beneficial, it may be especially important to do so in athletes who are highly ego-oriented. Given that self-compassion training has been shown to increase athletes' overall self-compassion levels, as well as decreasing their levels of self-criticism, rumination, and concern over mistakes, self-compassion may serve as a protective buffer against negative emotions induced by comparison situations in those high in ego orientation. A few limitations to note in this study, first, Firstly, the study used a cross-sectional design, meaning that data was collected only at one time point. The limitation with this is that it does not allow for inferences regarding causation. And next, the sample consisted of predominantly white athletes, which limits the generalizability of the results. Future studies should include a more diverse sample and also look at other competitive levels and divisions. Alrighty, thank you. And questions.
All right, thank you very much. So we're going to open it up for questions. We have about two minutes. So if you would just unmute yourself to ask, that would be great. Hey, RS, great job, man. Um, looking at Division One athletes, uh, what would you think would be different if you were to do a different level, like maybe a D3 athlete? Would, would you, do you think there's any difference there? Or what would you think? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, a lot of the research on goal orientation has showed that the more elite the athlete is, the more common it is for them to be high on both task and ego. Um, you know, it'll, they will, for example, Kobe or Michael Jordan, they obviously wanted to be the best, but that was fueled, uh, that fueled their training and how much they worked on their craft, which is task orientation. So I would think that even at division two and division three, that's still a top level. I'd expect ego orientation and tasks to be the same. But when you look at high school and uh, adolescence, I would think that um, you might find something different with their goal orientation. Hey, thanks. Thank you for the question. So we did have one question in the chat that asks if you would find a difference between team and individual sport athletes and their ego or task orientation and that they realized it wasn't your focus, but they were curious. That's, that's a great question. I, I do have data on both individual and team sports. I would be curious to run that analysis because if ego is about social comparison and you have individual sports where you're trying to beat your own previous uh, personal record, I'd be curious to know what that difference would look like. If, um, if you directly message me your email, I'm, I could run that analysis and get back to you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for your presentation. We're out of time, so we're gonna transition to the next presenter, so keep up the good work. So the next presentation is new insights into the early geological evolution of our solar system via recently discovered lunar meteorites from Antarctica. So you're, you're muted, there you go. Okay, um, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you just fine. Okay, awesome. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yep, you're good there too. Okay, awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shalene Ireland. I am a first year master's student here at Miami University working on new insights into the early geological evolution of our solar system via recently discovered lunar meteorites from Antarctica. Um, in the Department of Geology and Environmental Earth Science, I'm under the supervision of Dr. Claire McLeod. So why do we study the moon? So we sort of use an outside in approach because planetary objects provide insights into the formation of rocky planets in our inner solar system. So it will provide insights into how Earth formed as the majority of Earth's earliest geological record is lost from reworking of Earth's surface. And as you can see on the moon here, there are many different patches of like light and dark features. These dark features were formed from the most recent volcanic eruptions on the moon. And when I say recent, I mean 3.9 billion years ago. Um, and the moon is also Earth's closest neighbor and only natural satellite. So it has an absence of plate tectonics and an and has undergone minimal reworking of its surface. So this provides, so the moon is able to provide an extensive record of planetary formation and geological evolution is potentially preserved. And so NASA is sending uh, people back to the moon in 2024 and will send the first woman to the moon. So very exciting to see these new uh, missions upcoming. Also, uh, water was recently discovered on the surface of the near side of the moon. And this is a really important discovery as this water can potentially be used as a resource uh, for astronauts in future missions. So lunar meteorites, um, there are pieces of lunar materials that fall to the Earth from meteorite impacts on the moon, and they can come from any, anywhere on the moon here. So it can come from this dark patch here, this light patch here. And so basically lunar geology is classified into different groups of rocks. Um, so depending on what type of meteorite you have, 
um, you can't exactly pinpoint it to where on the moon it came from, but you can, but if you have something with a composition that's similar to this dark patch here, you know, okay, it came from a dark patch, but it again could have come from anywhere uh, where you see a dark patch on the moon. Also, lunar meteorites, they are a random distribution of lunar material. So there's a really good chance that they originated from different places other than the Apollo sampled sites. So they are potentially, they potentially come from um, deeper portions of the crust via meteorite impacts. And so these particular samples are brecciated. And so breccias are fragments of different rocks that are cemented together by the heat and pressure from meteorite impacts. So again, like they're a record of the earliest geological processes on the moon and provide a broader insight into the moon's geology. So our methodology here is acquire data on chemical compositions and physical attributes through various techniques. So here's an image of my sample here. This is a thin suction. That's about 1.2 centimeters along here. So this is a piece of moon rock. You're looking at a piece of the moon right here. So that's super cool. So one of our methods, um, so we are using a scanning electron microscope, microscope. And so here is one image of that. And so we are going to focus on this little mineral here or a solid chemical compound um, that is in rocks. So just kind of zoomed in on that little class there. And then we are just looking at a very, very small region here. And so looking at this image, we can then um, get a spectra of what's in this image here. So it'll tell us all the different elements that are in here. And then we can use that to identify what minerals are in the sample and overall what um, the sample is composed of. So analyzing a lunar meteorites based on its texture or the relationship between individual components and the rock sample, as well as its chemistry, uh, the chemical composition of the rock sample, so what is it made of, provides new insights into the geological components of not only these recently discovered meteorites, but of the moon more broadly as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to open it now for questions. So if you have a question, you can feel free to unmute yourself. All right, so I am interested. What got you interested in studying moon rocks? Um, you know, like when I was a kid and I would just look at the sky and I'd see a bunch of these bright little objects and then I saw this massive circular object in the sky and I was like, huh, what is that? And then over, and then over time I just kind of learned about the moon and I've just always been interested in it and I've just always had this drive to learn more about um, Earth's geological history as well as what this natural satellite object is that orbits our Earth. Thank you. So do we have any other guests here who would like to? Oh, so we have a question in the chat. So it says, will your work help to direct research in the Artemis project? Um, I, I definitely hope so. I definitely hope that this work, um, because it is um, a broader approach to studying lunar geology. I definitely hope that it does contribute to um, future work for the Artemis projects, absolutely. All right, so we have an additional question in the chat that says, how do you determine what part of the moon an unknown lunar meteorite came from? So it's really difficult to pinpoint exactly where a lunar meteorite comes from on the moon, but since lunar geology is classified into different groups of rocks, so if we can analyze what our sample is composed of and then match that to remote sensing data of the moon and categorize it into um, to see like which group it matches up with, we can determine like which areas it come from, but not specifically which um, part of those areas that the sample comes from.
All right, so we do have a little more time. If there's any other questions, you can either unmute, excuse me, or type them into the chat and I can read them. So we have an additional question that asks, which samples provide more data? So that is an excellent question. Um, so different samples will provide, um, depending on what they're composed of, um, it can provide data on all sorts of things. It kind of depends on which questions about the moon you are trying to address. Um, again, like sampled, um, so Apollo samples will provide really, really good insights into more of the upper surface of the moon. Meteorites have the potential to provide information not only on um, the upper portions of the surface, but also deeper portions of the crust as they could have originated from um, any part of the moon. So it really just depends on what you're looking at and what you're looking for. But any sample can tell you um, something about the moon's geological history. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for your presentation. We're going to transition to our last presenter of the session. Um, so these have all been great questions for our presenters, so please keep asking. So the last presenter of the session, um, do increases in water transparency related to invasive mussels promote the recovery of native juvenile fish in the Laurentian? I may have pronounced that wrong. Um, great Lakes. So Nikki, you can correct me if I totally just butchered the name of the Great Lake. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead and introduce yourself and what program you're in, and then when you're ready, go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name's uh, Nicole or Nikki Berry, and I am part of the Triple EB program in the biology department here at Miami. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about, can, first I should say, can everyone see my screen and you're seeing this screen, right? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about a subset of a much larger project that I'm um, a part of where we're trying to look at the potential um, differences in UV regulation of native and invasive space, uh, uh, fish. And so I'm going to focus um, more specifically on uh, looking at the spatial variation of UV in Lakes Michigan and Huron. So to provide you with a little bit more context for this project, the Great Lakes are increasing in transparency, especially Lakes Michigan and Huron. And there's two uh, foraging fish species that are both economically and um, ecologically important uh, species, especially for the Great Lakes fisheries. Uh, the first is alewife, which are, is our invasive species. It's declining in abundance across these lakes. Um, and there's especially uh, kind of decimated, or uh, depending on who you're talking to, many absent populations in Northwestern uh, Lake Huron. And there are smaller populations that are still um, persisting in Southeastern Lake Michigan. We know that there are summer spawners, which means um, in talking about UV radiation, summertime is going to be where we have the highest levels of exposure. And so both their eggs and their larval stages, um, which is what's pictured in the bottom left corner here, um, both of them are likely to be exposed to UV radiation and especially lethal levels. Uh, the uh, larval, stage of the fish is not very well pigmented. Um, if you look in this figure, you really see only this small black line and that's basically it. That's about the pigmentation uh, that we might expect from these fish. And pigmentation is important because it could provide protection uh, if a fish is exposed to UV radiation. So since it does not have a lot of this visual protection, we suspect that these fish have a very low UV tolerance, which means other things like changes in the water transparency are gonna be really important to the survivorship of these fish. Conversely, if we look at our native Cisco species and other um, related species, we know that they're um, starting to recover in their abundance. There's breeding populations of Cisco in Northwestern Lake Huron. We even have related species in Southeastern Lake Michigan. Uh, they are winter spawners, which means their eggs may be protected by ice, but the larval stages could still be exposed to UV radiation when ice melts and those eggs start to hatch. Uh, we do know from experiments that I've done related to this project that they have a moderate to high UV radiation tolerance compared to other species, and this is likely due to the uh, vast amount of pigmentation that you can see along their body at these uh, early life stages. And so when talking about these two fish and as far as the spatial UV, uh, variability of UV radiation in these two lakes, 
I mentioned that southeastern Lake Michigan still has a uh, small population of alewife per, kind of persisting, whereas northwestern Lake Huron uh, does not and has these native uh, species that are a little more UV tolerant that is um, breeding in, in this area. So we kind of wanted to know um, what could be the differences in UV exposure between these two portions of the lake. And we know that the whole lake is increasing in transparency as indicated by this bright green color, but the darker blue colors along the near shore regions of the lake, they're, while they're increasing in transparency, they're not increasing nearly as much as the offshore portions, which means there could be a UV gradient uh, that is being formed and by that a UV refuge in the near shore areas of the lake. When we think about southeastern Lake Michigan, there's large rivers that are entering into the lake and bringing with that water this really dark brown colored water and that could pr provide UV um, protection essentially. In northwestern Lake Huron, Lake Michigan waters as well as um, other par parts of uh, Lake Superior water is kind of mixing into this area here right near the Mackinac Bridge and in that area, you have essentially a lot of clear water entering into already clear water. So we expect maybe less of a gradient to persist in that region. Uh, for the rest of my talk, anytime you see kind of this blue teal uh, color, that's gonna indicate an increase or high risk of exposure to UV radiation. And then this brown coloration indicates a decrease or a low risk of exposure to UV radiation. So we went out and we actually measured the um, transparency and we measured the depth at which UV was uh, penetrating or how deep it went into the water. And on average in Northwestern Lake Huron, there was four point, uh, UV penetrated to 4.9 meters deep. And you can tell that for the most part, most of our sites was a pretty well blue colored. So it went pretty deep into the water. If we look at the percent difference from that average at each of the individual sites in this uh, more Northern area here, that I have circled in black, that's where our uh, Cisco populations are actually breeding. And there was a 10 to 20% decrease in uh, that UV depth. Still rather deep, about four to three to four meters deep, but there was a decrease. In our um, area down here where we see a 90% decrease, that's actually within the um, a river near Sheboygan. Um, and so that's a very small river that's not really contributing a lot as far as uh, that kind of brown coloration of water entering into the lake here, because you can see that right when you come out of that river, there's automatically a 20% increase in transparency. So overall, not a very strong UV gradient here and rather um, kind of higher exposure to light or to UV radiation. If we look at Southeast Lake Michigan though, you can see just from this picture in the center here of this, uh, plume from the rivers, and this is the St. Joseph River plume that's entering into the lake. So you see this brown water that's mixing with this very clear blue water. And with that, you see um, also a very strong UV gradient, changing from 90%, 90 to 50% uh, decrease exposure. And then in the offshore regions, increasing to about that 60, 50 to 60% increase in exposure. So there's a very strong gradient here. And we think that that's also promoting for that strong gradient is promoting for a UV refuge um, for our non-native and likely U low UV tolerance uh, fish. And in general, the average of all the sites that we sampled was lower at 3.6 meters deep instead of 4.9 meters deep. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone, um, all of our collaborators, especially the USGS who uh, allowed me to go out this summer in spite of the pandemic and sample the different portions of the lake, and I'll take any questions. All right, thank you very much. So we have plenty of time for questions. So if you'd like to pick Nikki's brain, now's the time. You can do it in the chat or feel free to unmute your mic. All right, so we do have a question in the chat. It says, are harmful algae balloons not significantly impacting transparencies in these lakes? Um, so I will say for, as far as I know, for the areas that I'm, um, I've been looking at, I don't think that harmful algal blooms have been as much of a concern, not as to the extent as which um, they've been drawing a lot of attention. And if you 
are familiar with Lake Erie, especially the western portion near uh, Toledo. I don't think algal blooms is as much of a concern, um, but I do know there are parts of Lake Huron where the water has been so transparent um, that uh, there's enough visible light um, that reaches the bottom of the of the lake that it's actually um, growing a different type of um, I want to call it algae, but it's it's a it's another kind of aquatic plant um, that can be more of a nuisance species. Um, I don't know if it actually has toxins associated with it or not, though. Um, and then I see someone else asked about the application to lead as a way to get rid of invasive species. So I don't know necessarily that and thinking about this as an application to get rid of invasive species, but we do know um, that, as I mentioned, the invasive alewife are declining. And it's interesting that this project, uh, one of the reasons the lakes are increasing in transparency is because of the introduction of um, invasive mussels and how well they do at filtering out all the phytoplankton um, out of the, the algae out of the water column. Um, so in a way, these invasive species may be changing the transparency of the lakes so that they're no longer promoting, um, you know, the current, the other current invasive, uh, invasive species such as our alewife fish. Um, someone else asked about what's causing the dark, darker water in the rivers. Um, so that it could be runoff. Um, I think most natural systems, uh, a lot of um, rivers do tend to bring in with them a lot of turbidity, sediment. Uh, we're specifically interested in dissolved organic matter, which if you think of making a cup of tea, uh, if you add your tea leaves into that water, that brown coloration that kind of leaches out into your clear water, that kind of is um, essentially organic, dissolved organic matter leaching into the water. Um, and so rivers are kind of a, a nice way, a body of water that does collect a lot of terrestrial inputs of organic matter, um, either through runoff or actually like leaves and stuff falling in from the riparian zone, things like that. So I have a question. How do you think climate change has played into all of this? So that's a great question. Um, so I, I will admit that um, I, UV hasn't been looked at very strongly in the lakes, uh, in the Great Lakes. Um, that's kind of one of my COVID backup plans is actually collecting as much UV data that existed uh, throughout the summer. And um, there's a decent amount, but not as nearly as much as other variables. And so I think I haven't looked at climate change specifically, but I have a couple ideas in mind. One being that um, with these extreme changes in precipitation events and then also drought events, there's can be really dramatic changes in the water levels um, of each of the lakes. And Lake Michigan is definitely one of the lakes that um, I see frequently in the news. The water levels are uh, at an all time high or they're back down to an all time low. Um, and I think if these larval fish, one of their way that they could be avoiding UV is by swimming deeper into the water column. But some of them, they're breeding in such shallow locations that if you had an if you had increased precipitation events from climate change, you could increase the water level and maybe increase that, um, basically that, that depth at which they could be lowering themselves to avoid UV. On the other hand, if you have a major drought events and that water level's um, declining so much so that they're, now they're, you know, it's becoming shallower, um, you know, that's reducing their, their UV refuge, at least vertically in the water column. And so something like these rivers might become more important where they could go and swim off into up rivers or into the more darker waters uh, along the near shore. Um, those are gonna become more, more important in those instances. And then I should say too, climate change of course can also be influencing the amount of water that's entering into the lakes from the terrestrial system. So we do know that um, climate change can, in that um, extent, precipitation and drought events can really strongly increase or influence the transparency um, which is also associated with the risk of exposure to UV. Thank you. So we do have some more time. So if we have any other questions for Nikki, you can put them in the chat. So we have Joanne who said, you mentioned this was part of a larger project. Could you elaborate on your impact with this project on a larger scale? Uh, yeah, so um, right now I think we're, we're pretty focused on, I guess, the implications of this for the Great Lakes. Uh, but I think in general, freshwater ecosystems, um, UV radiation is, can be an overlooked variable in my um, opinion. And I think 
that oftentimes people don't think about it, but we do know that, especially because of climate change, a lot of lakes are increasing in transparency or decreasing in transparency. And so we're kind of change, uh, seeing differences in what type of fish we're, communities we're seeing in each of these lakes. So I think my, um, my research is just providing another mechanism in which um, climate change could be influencing, that's influencing the transparency of these other lakes, how that transparency could then be, uh, changes could be influencing those fish populations. And so I think for managers um, as well for these fisheries, you know, it's something they can kind of better hopefully use at some point to maybe predict if they see a certain population that might become really vulnerable um, or not, and they might be able to better protect uh, certain habitats to, especially for native fish um, of those lakes. All right, everyone. So we are officially winding down. So I would like to take a moment just to open it up for any general questions. We have about five minutes left. For any of our presenters today, we had a lot of great presentations from the moon to the urchins, radio transmitters, et cetera. Um, so some great work being done. So just wanna, I'm gonna stop talking really quick. But if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself for any of the presenters. Hi everyone, this is Mike Crowder and I just wanted to congratulate all of the graduate students um, and also thank the graduates, uh, the graduate school staff and our alumni judges and, and faculty judges as well. Um, I will tell you I've watched, I watched 25 videos, the asynchronous, asynchronous ones this morning and then I've been at one of the sessions all afternoon and I am just blown away by all of the different projects that are going on and how well every one of you can explain things to people who are not experts in your field. I think um, this is a very important thing for um, all scientists and all researchers to be able to do it. And I just want to congratulate on you. Um, well done. And I'm so proud of all of you. All right, everyone. It looks like we've had a wonderful session. Also, once again, from me and the graduate school staff, kudos to all of our graduate students. We're so exceptionally proud of you and all the work that you're doing. So we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for attending the Graduate Research Forum this year. And then we'll be back in touch with our presenters with comments from the judges. So everyone take care and we'll sign off. <laughs>